Well, hello, everybody. Great to see you. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers. For those of you who haven't met yet, my name is Darren Chesky. I'm pastor here. I want to welcome you. So glad you're here. We're also celebrating a national holiday called Juneteenth. I know some of you don't know about that, but that is a, that's a holiday that's been celebrated for 100 years. Actually, it was when Abraham Lincoln uh, made the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863 not everybody heard the news. It wasn't until two years later that every place in America was finally when the slaves heard in Galveston, Texas, that they truly were free and what a day of celebration that was. And actually that's what we celebrate here at Heartland every single day, that, that God loves every person, that all people are equal, there's equality, there's equity in the eyes of God for every person. And a lot of people don't know yet that there is freedom that God has for them. They know about God, they've heard the name Jesus, but they really don't know how free they can be. And so that's what this church is about. We wanna help people know God personally, not just, he's not just a subject to be studied, but a person to be known. And then you can find freedom from all of the hurts, the hangups, the habits of yesterday. The, it's like having glasses that are dirty. And when God removes that and you stop looking through the lens of yesterday, God makes you truly free. And then we want to help you discover your purpose so that you can make the difference God has called you to make. And I wanna just celebrate the leaders in this church, not in the building of this church, but people who are a part of this church who are serving and leading every day, Monday through Friday in the community. Uh, one of our members this week was just elevated to a significant position in our community. Reggie Simmons was appointed the principal of HSE High School. He's a member of our, Reggie, you here? You in the... Hey, give him a big hand over there. Reggie Simmons, my friend. <laughs> so proud of you. Been a part of our ministry for about 15 years and watching him serve. He's not new to our community. He's been a part of our church, been a part of the HSE school system for 15 years now. And now to be in this position. It's what, what an incredible honor. We will be praying for you. We're gonna pray for, for Reggie Simmons. Remember that name. And I'm just so proud of so many of you. Many of you serve. We, uh, we have uh, principals and the school superintendent and other people in this community that, in government and business, that we, I'm just so proud of God raising up people to, to love people well in every sector of our uh, community. I'm really proud of you. Today, I brought a great friend to, to be part of uh, our service today. You've already met him, Pastor Aaron Lindsay. My wife and I are enjoying a rest. How many of you are glad that we're gonna do that? We are resting right now, so I'm technically not even, I'm still on vacation. I'm coming to church like a normal person today. <laughs> uh, but it was great, I wanted to see my grandsons now, which is amazing. And uh, my wife and I are just enjoying time together. We've been on the beach a little, can you tell? And. Um, 32 years of marriage, how about that? So uh, I love her more today. But I called a friend of mine to come and be with us today. Now, I've known about Aaron Lindsay for over 20 years. I, I remember when we started our church here, I said, who's the greatest musician ever to come out of Indianapolis? I'd ask people and they'd say, well, you know, there's this guy, Aaron Lindsay, and he's gone on. If you Google his name, you'll read about all that he's accomplished and what God has done through him, the multiple Grammy Awards he has won as a worship and music producer. But I ran into him, we got introduced by a mutual friend a year ago, and it's like God had a friendship. It's one of those moments where you feel like, you've been my friend my whole life, I just didn't know you. And God has knit our hearts together in a beautiful way. He's planting a brand new church in this season of his life, God's called him to reach he has so much influence in the LA area and God is calling him to start a new church right in that LA, uh, in the middle of LA, in the heart of all of this creative world. And a part of what you give is gonna be a part of getting that church started. But I'm so, you're gonna hear more about that today. Come on, put your hands together and welcome my dear friend, Pastor Aaron Lindsay. What's up, Heartland Church? How y'all doing? Come on, let's everybody just stand up and give God a hand praise. Come on. Come on, get up, get up, get up, get up, get up. He's worthy, he's worthy, he's worthy. Now let's give a little bit to the fathers today. Come on, y'all. Celebrate the dads. All right. God bless you. You can be seated. You can be seated. 
Man, it's so good to see all your wonderful, handsome, and pretty faces. That's what a father's supposed to say. Some, you know, every child that's born out of you is not pretty or handsome. In fact, they kind of look a little strange when they first show up on the earth. I've had people, so I know what I'm talking about. I've, I'm, me and my wife, my wife Adrian is here. Stand up, babe. Wave to the people. Stand up. Show them. Show them. Look at, isn't she lovely? Isn't she wonderful? My wife and I have three beautiful kids, and uh, we, uh, yeah, we made people. And it's interesting being a parent. Um, we had a, a unique experience that I would love to share with y'all. Do y'all mind if I just share a little bit? Can we? So like I'm in my living room a little bit, just come on, y'all, just chill out. It's Father's Day. We're going to be all right. On the way from the airport, I've been flying for almost 30 years, been in the music business and, you know, flying and traveling. And I had a, a unique experience this time when I landed back in good old Indy. First of all, this airport, what happened? I'm like, man, this is a big old airport. Like, I remember when it was like Southwest, just a couple of airlines here and there. But uh, we, we got into an Uber. How many of y'all Uber folks out here? I don't know. Listen, L.A. is like Uber heaven. Like, kids don't even get driver's licenses. Like, ah, insurance is too expensive. I'll just Uber everywhere. What's wrong with you? Um, so we got into Uber, and I even sprung for the Uber black, like the nice car, you know, because it was late, and we are getting to the hotel. And a strange thing happened. We got a photo of it. I was driving. We were driving down 69. And as we were going down the highway, we got hit by a random car going 70. We're going 70 miles an hour or so right before our exit. We got hit in the back, and our car began to slide. And my wife was resting. I was on texting with my son. And, you know, we grew up old school Pentecostal. So, you know, first thing we did, Jesus, Jesus. <laughs> you know, oh, Jesus, oh, Lord. And my driver, I don't know what his faith is. He joined in, Jesus, Jesus, you know. <laughs> car starts sliding. And I, I just, the, the car hit us again in the front. And, and it turned us toward the guardrail, and that airbag deployed, and all I could see was the guardrail. And all I can imagine is this accident was designed to flip us over the guardrail. We're going 70 miles an hour toward a guardrail out of control. And that airbag deployed, and right on time, thank God, because my head should have gone through that door right there. And I, all I can see is the angel of the Lord, because we were supposed to flip. But I believe God sent his angel, and he stuck his hand out and said, nope. And the car slid down the guardrail. We lost the front right tire. It just sheared right off. And uh, we slid for 100 yards to a stop. And my wife and I walked away with small minor scratches, seat belt burns, little things. But we walked away with our lives. We walked away fine. And all that tells me is that God has something planned for you guys today that the enemy does not want you to receive. So just let's bind up Facebook, bind up Instagram and Twitter right now. Let's just lean into the presence of God, all right? Because don't, don't be distracted because I believe God's going to do something incredible for you. I am a father, so I celebrate Father's Day with the fathers today. And I also want to shout out the wonderful Fishers Police Department. I forgot to tell you all this part of the story. This brother has never been in a police car before. So, so we're on the side of the road, and I'm like, how do you get an Uber on the side of the highway? after a crash. Do I even want to get in an Uber now after I just got in a crash? So the wonderful officer Smiley, I don't know if he's here, if he's watching, he gave, he gave us a ride and I was in the back of the car. I was like, okay, so this is how the other side lives. <laughs> uh -uh, Juneteenth, baby, I ain't getting in the back of the car no more. No, 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 get me out of here. <laughs> he drove us to the hotel. We got out and when we got in our rooms, we just began, I, I fell to my knees. My wife fell to our knees, and we began to worship and thank the Lord because if the enemy had his way, it could be another story being told today. I'm just so grateful for my heavenly Father for, for, for bringing us here safely. And um, I want to share a song with you today that I wrote to my heavenly Father. It's called Perfect Father. I have kids and I'm far from perfect. I get it wrong a lot, in fact. I don't get it right a lot. I do a lot of apologizing to my kids. Any fathers, can I get a witness in here? <laughs> Man, it's tough being a dad. 
but thank God for his grace. And I wrote this song to my heavenly father because how many of us, all of us need our heavenly father, no matter what. It says, my soul is fractured and I know that it is because I've been holding the weight. The weight of my burdens, I should have left at your feet in your presence that day. Caring more than I have to because of a false sense of responsibility. But you tell me, child, come and sit for a while, but I find myself far too busy. But I can't afford to ignore it. Every mistake, God, I own it. I need my father to hold me. You wipe away my tears You give me hope for fear You are the perfect father And I love you You take away my pain You help me smile again You are the perfect father And I Daddy, I do. I measure myself with a standard of wealth that just makes me feel far worse and worse. Looking alive but still screaming inside because what I experience hurts. People depend on their really strong friend, but I can't seem to find one for me. But you look and smile and say, stay for a while, but again, I'm just far too busy. But now I can't afford to ignore it. I pour out my soul in this moment. Only if I... You wipe away my tears. You give me hope for fear. You are the perfect father. And I need you. You wipe away my pain. Walk with me through the rain. You are the perfect father. I love you, Daddy, I do. I do, I do, I do. Father, I stretch my hands to you. No other hand. can I go? Father, I stretch my hands to you. No other help I know. Cause you hold me close and you promise you never let me go. 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 Never let me go. You never let me go. No matter what, you won't let me go. You hold me safe in your arms like a little child. You never let me go.
Thank you, Lord, for being the perfect Father. I love the piano. I really do. Like, it's a magical instrument to me. It just... I don't even really love to play. I love what playing does in a room. And I love the piano because my dad played the piano when I was a kid. My dad was the minister of music of our church growing up. So I used to, you know, that's the old, that's what they used to call worship pastors, (laughs) minister of music. And uh, my daddy played piano, but he played it more like... I saw my daddy play it. I mean, he would, he would, he would, he stomp his foot. I was like, whoa, that's some piano right there, buddy. Yeah, we got all refined and pretty and, you know, perfect father. That was some real playing. And my dad, his, his piano playing really influenced me. And, and I started at about 16 years old and I realized that, you know, man, this, this instrument is great. My dad was great. And now that I have children, which I, I like to show y'all a picture of my kids, I have three kids. That's my, my lovely wife, Adrian, and uh, the guy on the, the right of me or to your left with all that beautiful hair that I used to have. <laughs> That's my 18-year-old Aaron. And the beautiful girl next to my wife is my 20-year-old Kennedy. And that tough guy looking like the rock on the left is my 14-year-old son, Blake. And uh, I've had people. Those are the people that we've had. We've we've had people. Anybody else had people? (laughs) Uh, They're watching online, too. And uh, when I get home, I need a a Father's Day card, all right? Just because I'm not there, you know, you know, we got a deal. Anyway, uh, my kids are great. And uh, they didn't tell me about fatherhood that at some point your kids would turn on you. Like they would not just turn on you, but turn into you. And I think my mom was trying to warn me when I was a child because she used to, used to say things to me like, oh, wait, wait till you have your own kids. Anybody's mother ever said that to them? Wait till you have your own kids. And I'm telling you right now, I feel like I'm in a weird movie, a strange bi- like autobiography of myself, and it's my kid playing the role of me, and I'm playing the role of my parents. And I'm saying things that my mom said to me when I was a kid and my dad said to me. Things like, I brought you in this world, I'll take you out. And then make another one that looks just like you when I'm done. My kids would come up to me, Dad, I don't need whatever. I want to go to the mall. And my mama used to say to me, you got some mall money? Anybody ever had their mama say, you got some mall money? I say that to my kids now. I'm looking in the mirror and I'm like, oh, my God, I'm my parents. They were right. The other thing my mother said to me when I was young, I grew up, I said, in a Pentecostal church. So, I, you know, we talked a lot about going to the bad place. You better live right. You're going to go to the bad place. So, you know, my mom used to say, hey, mom, I want some ice cream. She says, people in hell want ice water, baby. People in hell want <laughs> ice water. So now I got to worry about the fact that I could be eternally separated from God in a place of torment that's really hot. And they don't have ice water. A painful thought for a 10-year-old. <laughs> but, man, one of the beautiful things about being a parent is that you get to see your children develop and become and grow. And I want to thank God for uh, Pastor Darren and Miss Lori for being great examples, not of just pastors, but I got a chance to hang out with their kids. And I'm telling you, when I listen to Nick preach, I'm like, oh, boy, Darren, you better mark your days, bro. He coming for your job, Doc. He coming for your job. <laughs> And then I met Darren's dad, Papa Shesky, is the best man on planet Earth, man. I spent days with him and just the wisdom and, and his wife. Boy, you better not cross her. I'll tell you what. She's a general in the kingdom, man. She's for real about it. And, uh, man, to just to see your children every day become more and more refined. And I don't know where you are in your experience with your earthly father. I, I, I want to honor dads, but I also want to consider the fact that maybe you didn't have a great experience with your dad today. Maybe this is a rough day. Maybe, like me, I lost my mother. Mother's Day was weird. 
Maybe you've lost your father, and today is a little bit strange. But one thing we can rest assured is that we all have a heavenly father, yeah. that no matter what your experience with your dad, your earthly father is, your father, your heavenly father loves you. He will never leave you, and he'll never forsake you. And no matter how good your experience is with your father or how well you're doing as a dad today, we can all sit and take notes from our Heavenly Father. So why don't we just turn our attention to the scriptures today. Galatians chapter 4 tells us that we are God's children. Galatians 4, 4 through 7 says, But when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law, meaning he came into the earth naturally. He didn't bypass the process. He had to come into the earth legally. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law, so that he could adopt us as his very own children. Isn't that good news to know? And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son, Jesus, into our hearts, prompting us to call out Abba, Father. Now, Abba is an Aramaic word meaning daddy. That's why I wrote it in my song. Because I don't just see God as this cosmic father sitting in a rocking chair in heaven giving me what I want. I see him as my daddy that's involved intimately in my life. How many know God wants to be intimately involved? He wants you to see him as, yes, his papa, his daddy. He wants a relationship with us. Now you are no longer a slave, no longer a slave to fear. <laughs> but you are God's own child. And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. That right there qualifies all of us as God's children. And because we're his children, we can cry out, Abba, Father. Somebody shout, Daddy! Now, what do kids do that are uh, their, their, their uh, parents? The best evidence of a child of God is in Romans. Let's look at Romans chapter 8. I'm going to walk through the scriptures. Is it okay if we walk through the Bible a little bit? I mean, this is church. We ought to talk about the Bible, right? right. Paul says, for all who are led by. Somebody say led by. Led by. Man, say it like you in L.A. real quick. Say led by. Led by. The Spirit of God are children of God. So that means the mark of a child of God is that you are led by. By that same spirit that we received in Galatians chapter 4, the spirit of his son that came into us. We are now led by that spirit, and we are the sons of God. Now, let's look back at the words of Jesus in John chapter 5 through 19. This is amazing. This is Jesus, the miracle worker, the son of God, the word manifest in flesh. These are his words. I tell you the truth. Sound like my mama. I tell you the truth. The son can do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees the father doing. Whatever the father does, the son does also. Everybody say that. Whatever the father does, the son also does. One more time. Whatever the father does, the son also does. I wanted to burn that into your, your conscience today because this is the mark of a son. This is the mark of a daughter, a child of God. We want to model what the Father does because the Father has shown us clearly in the most famous passage of Scripture in the Bible, John 3.16, also the words of Jesus. Keep in mind, these are the words of Jesus, giving us the example of what the Father does. Let's turn to John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish. Ain't that good news right there? He didn't say whoever dies on a cross. He didn't say whoever gives a million dollars. He didn't say whoever lays down themselves to, to die physically. He said whoever believes in the one that he sent should not perish, but have, everybody say, everlasting life. What did the father do? If the son does what the father does, and this is Jesus talking, if children do what their father does or what their parents do in the natural, how much more should we model what our heavenly father has done for us? The first thing the father did for us is he loved us. John 3, 16, for God so loved. He didn't just love, he so loved. He loved the world so much. That world not only includes the ones that are in the building today, that world includes the people that are out there. That world includes the people that are far from God. That world includes people that don't even like God. Imagine this. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. So if God loves us, how do we model that out? We need to love others. You can't be walking around hateful and mean, stuck up and pious. I'm from L.A. And I'm not just from L.A. 
we're planting a church in Calabasas. You ever seen the Kardashian show? That's where them people are at. Those folk. And in Calabasas, there's, this, there's a wonderful group of people out there that are, some are far from God. And you know what? Their, their biggest issue is, is affluenza. <laughs> they can make it rain. And when, you, when you're wealthy, sometimes you don't feel like you need God. What do I need God for? I can just buy anything I need. But he loves them so much. And we have to show love to everyone, no matter what their socioeconomic status is, no matter what their preferences are, no matter what life they're in. God loves them, and we need to reach them for Jesus and bring them into the kingdom. How do we show that? Romans, uh, actually, 1 John 4, 7 and 8 says, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. He that loves not knows not God, for God is for God is, so if you don't love, you don't even know God. Isn't that amazing? Because God is love. So God loves the world. He loves us. So we have to show love to our neighbor. Love your neighbor as yourself. How many want to show God's love today? All right, I'm just I'm body checking you today. I'm just going to push on it a little bit. The second thing the father did was he gave his best. Now, I love a lot of people. I love my family. I love my friends. I would do almost anything for many of my friends. But the one thing I'm not sure I would do was give any of my children, let alone my only. I don't know if I would give some of them my only car, <laughs> let alone my only child. And God did not just give us anything. He gave his only begotten son to a world that didn't even want him, didn't even like him. He gave his only begotten son. So if God gives, then we should give. How do we give? If Jesus was God manifested in flesh, then God basically gave himself. He gave his son a manifestation of himself. The scripture says that um, we are to present our bodies in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Present ourselves as a living sacrifice. You know what the problem with a living sacrifice is? A living sacrifice keeps getting up and crawling off the altar. <laughs> It's like, I'm a living sacrifice. Oh, let me get up and do this myself. But we need to present our bodies, wholly acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. In another translation, it says, which is your purest act of worship. We can sing for 30 minutes. We can lay on the altar. We can pray for people and everything. But our most pure act of worship is giving God yourself. God wants all of the things that you bring to the table, but he wants you more than he wants anything. Yes, our giving of our resources is important because generosity is a reflection of our life. Your money represents your time, and your time represents your life. So when you give God your money, you're giving God a part of your life. That is a part of it, but more than your money, he wants your body. He wants your mind. He wants you to bring yourself to him. Why? So he can win this world back to the light. Why? That whoever believeth on him should not perish. So God gave his best, and the last thing he did was saved us from death. I don't know about you, but I do not want to die a horrible death away from God. You know, I went to the beach uh, with my wife and my family, and we were out there, and I was floating in the water. You know, salt water makes you buoyant. Anybody know what that word means? It means you can float on the top without having to work. And I'm a big dude, as you see, so it takes a lot of salt to keep me on top. And this, this big guy was laying back with my sunglasses on and chilling in the water, and I'm just laying there, and the Bible talks about perishing. And often we talk about perishing as dying quickly or horrible death, but I liken perishing to drifting. And I remember laying on that water, and I was minding my business, just enjoying myself with the seagulls and all the water, and I'm just out there, big old black man floating on the water. And I look up, and all of a sudden I've drifted a little bit away. I'm like, huh. I didn't even feel it. I'm kind of getting out there. I lay back down again, and before I know it, I'm drifting a little further, and I'm going, and I'm going, I'm enjoying myself, and I hear the seagulls and the children and everything. I look up again. I'm drifting a little further. This is how sin affects us if we're not careful. We can miss the mark and get comfortable and not mindful, and before you know it, you're getting further and further away from shore, and you're slowly drifting into darkness. And before you know it, you look up and you're further than you've ever been. But the problem with drifting is that you don't feel it. Before you know it, you're all the way a different place than you started. That's the scary part of sin. You know what else is scary about sin? The fact that I've only been back here for a matter of seconds and already 
our eyes and our ears have adjusted to the darkness. We've adjusted to not seeing the speaker. We've adjusted to the fact that he's talking from backstage somewhere, and we wonder, is he coming back? But it's actually not a problem because what he's saying is okay, and and I'm enjoying myself. But the Scripture says uh, two verses down from that very same John 3.16, actually 3, John 19 says, God's light came into the world, but people love the darkness more than the light for their actions were evil. In verse 20, all who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for fear that their sins will be exposed. I don't know about you, but it's kind of uncomfortable, isn't it? Is this guy coming back? Is he going to stay back there? How long is this illustration going to last? That's how sin is sometimes. You get uncomfortable, but you don't want to come back to the light because you don't want to be exposed. But God says in verse 20 that those who, at 21, but those who do what is right or those who love the truth, they don't stay in the darkness. They come to the light so that others can see that they are doing what their father wants them to do. When you begin to do what God loves, every day you make choices that your father will make. Every day. Now, this is not getting it perfect, but this is drifting toward the light, coming back to the light. He said those that love the truth come to the light. I want to come to the truth. What is the truth? What did Jesus say? I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And no man comes to the Father except that he comes by me. And if Jesus is the truth and we model what Jesus shows us, we will stay in the light because maybe you were made to shine, shine bright like a diamond. You're supposed to be in the light. You weren't made for the darkness. You were made for the light. Everybody I see in this room, you've got light on you. You've got light in you. You've got light to shine. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Let your light so shine so that men can see your good works and glorify and glorify your Father in heaven. This is why we got to stay in the light so we can bring glory to the Father. And whosoever believeth in him, I said, if you get it early, I won't have to preach so long. Whosoever believes in him shall not perish. Do I have any whosoever's in the building right now? Is there anybody in this room that knows I am a whosoever? All I got to do is believe. He didn't tell me to do anything but believe, and I know that I can receive everlasting life. I thought I would just throw it back a little bit. God wants us to shine this light so that the world can see that he loves them and he died to save them and that whoever believes on him will have everlasting life. Our role is to fulfill the great commission, but it starts with the great commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. Then go in and do the great commission. Make disciples. There's a story I want to share with you. I went on YouTube and saw this audiologist. And I'm going to close here. There's an audiologist. Uh, they got this surgery that people who have been deaf, that have never heard, they're able to give them the gift of hearing. And I saw this video of an audiologist working with a young lady. And they give you these beeps first to make sure that the thing is working. And so she heard the beeps. Beep, beep. And she said, ooh because she had heard for the first time. She's like, whoa. And she's like, oh, something, yeah, it, it, something is loud. So she could talk and she could read lips, but it, it wasn't clear because she had never heard. Uh, it, it's loud, something's loud, I, I don't know. And the, and the audiologist looked at her and said, stop talking. And she looked at the lady and said, do you still hear the loud thing? And the young lady who had never heard said, no, oh, it's back. And at that moment, she realized the loud thing was her very own voice. She had never heard, so she didn't know what she was hearing. She just said, whatever this is, is loud. I don't even know. (gasps) It's my own voice. And she grabs her eyes, and she begins to weep, tears of joy, because my whole life, I hadn't been able to hear, and this is what it sounds like. I just thought it was a noise, but it's my voice. And as she's sitting there crying, her father comes in the room. Her dad goes, hey, baby, and she turns, and they begin to cry and hug and embrace, and the audiologist is sitting there watching this miracle happen, and the girl's like, thank you, and she's like, oh, my God, and I'm watching, and I'm crying. I got tissue at home. 
this girl had never heard, I've made my living with my ears. I can't imagine what it would be to not be able to hear. But I want to thank you, Heartland, for the missions that you guys do all around this world, digging wells in Sierra Leone, helping people in need, also helping plant churches. And my question for you today is who do you think God blessed the most? The girl that had never heard, who finally got to hear, the father who witnessed his daughter hearing his voice for the first time, or the facilitator, the audiologist that helped create a space for someone for the first time in their lives to hear the voice of their father. Heartland Church, the work that you're doing by helping Believe, Believe LA, Believe Church Los Angeles, reach these amazing people for God and also come alongside other great churches that are already out there doing the work of the kingdom. You are helping us to facilitate a space for someone who may have never heard the sound of their father's voice to begin to hear. And maybe today in this service, you're like, man, something pricked my heart. Maybe it was in the worship, maybe it was in the prayer, maybe it was in the song Perfect Father, or maybe something I said pricked your heart. And you're like, man, I've been far from God, I drifted away. And I hear the voice of the call, Father, softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. I hear the voice of my Father calling me back to the light. I've been afraid of my sins being exposed, but the thing I know about God's nature is he will cover you. He'll put a ring on your finger, put a rope on your back, just like the prodigal son's dad killed a fatted calf and threw a party because he wants you back more than he wants to talk to you about your sin. In fact, he doesn't even want to talk about it. He wants to remove them. And maybe today you need to get yourself back into the light. Or maybe you never heard God calling you like he's calling you today. It's time to man up. It's time to woman up. It's time to accept the fact that you cannot get away from the call of God. He's going to keep calling you. He's going to keep loving you. He's never going to let you go. He's going to love you until you come. No man can come to the Father unless he draws him. And if you feel that today, why don't you just lift up your hand all over the building. If you feel the Lord drawing you back, either you've been drifting and you're coming back, or you've never made this kind of prayer, you've never asked the Lord into your heart. Maybe we've got a heart full, a room full of Christians, but you're like, yeah, I've been called to certain assignments, and I haven't been faithful to those assignments. God is calling you back to it. I used, to, I used to give myself, I used to serve, I used to present my body as a sacrifice to God, but I'm coming back. I used to give faithfully, but I'm coming back. I used to love on people, I used to go serve, but, but I need to come back. No matter which category you fall into, do me a favor, everybody just bow your heads. I wanna pray over you because I believe God sent me here on assignment. The devil could not stop it. No accident could stop it. Delayed flights could not stop it. Even the things that tried to stop you from getting here today could not stop you from getting to this moment. God wants to meet you right in your seat. Father, in the name of Jesus, you are a good father. You love us, God. You love us with an everlasting love. And I can sense that you are echoing the words of love into the souls and hearts of everyone that's in this room today. God, I ask that you would bypass their conscience. I pray that you would get down into their soul and their spirit and that you would begin to reverberate your love. Let the pools and the windows of heaven open. Lord, let the water of the Holy Spirit wash their souls. Lord, wash them mind, body, and soul. Help them respond to you in a way that gives them the freedom that they have been living for and longing for for years. And God, I speak freedom over them right now. I speak deliverance over those that are struggling and those that have not gotten past this point. I pray, God, that you would allow your angels to release them into their destiny and that they would say yes to your call. Maybe this is your first time ever being in a service where you feel the Lord speaking to you like that. I want everyone in here to help me. And those of you that have never asked God into your heart that want to do that, we're all going to pray the sinner's prayer together. I want y'all to help me pray it, everybody, whether you're saved or not, because we don't want anyone to feel uncomfortable, okay? So repeat these words after me. Father, come on, say it. Father, in the name of Jesus. I ask that you would come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. I turn away from sin and I turn to you. I turn to the light. I ask that you would be my savior and I will give you my life for the rest of my life. Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, we have next steps because we want to make sure that we solidify what God has started in this moment. This is just the beginning of a beautiful journey, whether you just got saved for the first time or whether you're coming back into an awareness that God has something powerful for you and you've been drifting. All right? Hartman, thanks for letting me come back. I love y'all so much. Pray for Believe LA. And kids, I'll see you when I get home. I need my, I need my Father's Day card when I walk in the house. <laughs>